I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Seven years old and the sun had just set. This enormous craft came across the sky. I felt that this was the beginning of a tremendous destiny. She must have had her first intimations or contact with flying saucers because she took these photographs. Those are the first ones that were photographed in 1956. Okay, so that is Elizabeth Clara. And that is certainly a story that's quite close to home for me. It's a South African who apparently had a relationship with an alien. And uh, her story is documented in this book, uh, Beyond the Light Barrier, the autobiography of Elizabeth Clara. So uh, let me quickly just read what it says there. Uh, shall I? Make it a little bit bigger. Um, this is the autobiographical story of Elizabeth Clara, a South African woman, and Akon, an astrophysicist from Meton, a planet of Proxima Centauri, that at a distance of about 4.3 light years is our nearest stellar neighbor. Anyway, so that's one story we can look into. Um, she, you can also get just a generic taste of what she's talking about, but it's a South African woman. And um, <clears throat> this is really the, the setting for her um, encounters with UFOs. Um, I don't think there are any additional photos here, but that is the location in South Africa where it apparently occurred. But we can uh, go into this if you guys want to. Uh, she even apparently conceived a child with this particular being. Now, how can I put this? Um, when I traveled to Roswell, by the way, hello, everyone. Uh, hey, Joe. Hey, Chelsea, Brooks, Yvette, Terry. Uh, some of you quite excited to be dealing with this. Even Timmy is excited because he knows he gets some lap time. Um, but um, I suppose it kind of became quite a real question for me when when I drove through Roswell with, with a friend and um, kind of a question I was asking was what actually happened in Roswell I mean I like like many of you I've been exposed to snippets and um, the odd documentary but you know if you had to ask me you know what really happened at Roswell is it official you know what is the official story there and so that kind of made me think well maybe it's time for a refresher the other thing is when you when you address this question um someone said it's not a question of are there ufos but are there aliens i'm um, i'm not that far i've got to say i'm not that far i think the first question is have we seen um ufos and some people are saying no it's another name well maybe i'm old school but uh we've known always thought about it as flying saucers uh ufos whatever if you want to call it by some other name great but we're going to be calling it ufos for the purpose of this episode but the the issue for me isn't do aliens exist but first has anyone seen a, a UFO that is indeed not from here? And um, I think a lot of people jump over that hoop. They basically say, no, 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 there are lots of UFOs. People have seen UFOs all over the place. Um, there's just so much information about it. Okay, well, name one. Um, and then maybe you can name one, but I still don't think we've jumped that hoop. Once you jump over that hoop, then I suppose you can say, okay, so... Where do these spaceships that definitely exist come from? And what sort of creatures are piloting these ships and 
for how long have they been piloting them and do they have a base on Neptune, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what tends to happen is people's imaginations get fired up and we want to get to the next step. Um, we're sort of very impatient to get to the next step. And um, uh, for the purposes of this analysis, we're going to um, look at the um, just a question. Uh, have there, ha has there ever been a, a UFO on Earth? Now, um, I think about 25% of you in chat seem to be, have quite a strong view that uh, aliens are amongst us. One of them is Deborah. Uh, she says, I believe they're already here amongst us. And, you know, there's some movies that have definitely made the whole idea quite appetizing. Superman is an alien and, and a very nice alien. He's kind of like a messianic figure. He's kind of a, a, a very benign um, figure that is, that is you know, um, part of truth, what truth, justice, and the American way. I mean, an alien that is more American than arguably America um, right. And so this whole idea of, of aliens among us has become quite, quite normalized, uh, except when they come across the border, then of course, it's not very uh, appetizing or, or interesting. Yvonne says, I have a hard time believing in aliens. Let's do a quick, uh, a quick poll. Um, how are we going to do it? Uh, let's just see how many of you think that, as uh, Deborah does, that, that there are aliens amongst us. So if you believe that, then, um, you know, if you like Elizabeth Clara, then uh, write yes. And if you think there, there's not evidence, write no. Let's just kind of get a sense of that. Valerie says no evidence for that. Let's, let's just kind of get a sense of... So just yes, if you think there are aliens amongst us, and no, if you think there aren't. Uh, but please just keep it to yes or no. Otherwise, it's a little bit difficult to see. Okay. So kind of a mixed bag. Um, I saw quite a few no's. There's a maybe that's someone breaking the rules. Um, it's you only allowed to answer yes or no. Um, I'm trying to see if there's a basic majority, but I, I must say I can't actually. Um, okay, so that is quite interesting. There's quite a kind of a mixed bag of you. Um, how can I put this? Um, I'm certainly not God, and I'm certainly not the all-knowing being or whatever. So what I'm going to share with you guys is simply my opinion, and, and really a lot of it isn't even my opinion, simply something that has been generated. It's a narrative that's been generated, and uh, make of it what you will. I mean, uh, if you disagree with me, then you can say, well, that was an interesting point of view that I didn't expect or something like that. But I think you, we've also got to think about the psychology behind the very idea. Why is the UFO thing even a thing? Why is it important? Well, yeah, why is simply the question, do UFOs exist? Why is it even important, right? Um, is it going to change world history? Is it part of world history already? Um, does it really matter, right? And I think there, in a way, two answers to that question. Um, but certainly I think one of the answers is, I think to the extent that we are interested in aliens and so on, uh, shows to what extent I think we have a distrust for what is going on in our world. And so I think it in a way, um, uh, manifests in that way. It also, I think, gives one a sense that um, the whole power dynamic that we assume to exist may be completely different. And who knows, maybe that is even true, um, but not true in the way we think, but 
that the idea that everything we've known about um, life and the universe is actually not the way we understand it. And if anything, that kind of thinking is maybe useful in, in that it helps us think critically. The reason why I'm covering this topic is because in my true crime uh, crusade, if you want to call it that, one of the things I try to deal with is this question of interpreting reality. How good interpreters are we of reality? And you would think with so much information, so much recorders of information, so many sources of information, that we would be better than ever at figuring out what's going on around us, and yet we seem to be worse than ever. Grace says, I believe that aliens are actually demons. Okay, so um, so let's get going. And, and um, look, I'm a storyteller, and I've had to think about how do I tell the story um, in a way that sort of is sensible and makes sense, and, and what is the logical place to start? And once again, I must just say, this is only my opinion. You might say, no, 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 the, the logical place to start is with news headlines, like the current news headlines. I'm not going to do that. Uh, for me, the logical place to start is Roswell. To me, the logical place to start is where is this sort of um, uh, epicenter of alien law, if I can put it that way, and, and, and this whole idea of spaceships. And you may disagree. You might say, no, no, it's not Roswell. It's somewhere else. But um, I went to Roswell, and, I mean, even you can see the sign behind me. Even the sign to Roswell is basically a, a flying saucer that's crashed into the, um, you know, the city sign or the, you know, whatever. And when you're in Roswell, there are sort of alien-themed things all over the place. Uh, maybe I can show you guys a couple of pictures. Um, I did um, I did actually email myself some images, but unfortunately they were um, what's the word? Um, saved to Google um, you anyway, know I think I've got one here. This is a, this is actually a just a street uh, when you when you turn into Roswell, it's just an alley, and there you can see is a, a kind of a fake alien looking out the window. But th there's quite a bit of this in Roswell, just the um, playing with the idea of you know aliens amongst us, right? But, uh, you know, it was while driving to Roswell, and funny enough, it wasn't even my idea to go to Roswell. While I was in America and while I communicated my um, intentions, like where I was going to travel, someone actually suggested go to Roswell. And then I realized, well, Roswell is on the way to, um, to Moffat from where I was driving in Texas. And so I did pop in there. And um, while we were there, the, the thought did come up, what actually did happen in Roswell? And what was quite interesting was, you know, this channel is, is kind of themed around rocket science. And I personally am quite interested in rockets and science. And also, um, while we were in Roswell, we visited a exhibition of rockets. But the very first rockets that were invented and tested by a guy called Robert Goddard. Now, incidentally, my mother's maiden name was Goddard, uh, no relation to the famous Robert Goddard, but nevertheless sharing the same uh, name. And uh, so you had this exhibition of the first rockets um, that we ever tested. And it just made me think, wow, um, I, I couldn't help thinking, is that why aliens went to Roswell? Because they realized people were starting to um, do things 
you know, in the rocket sense. And that kind of made sense to me. But then I, I did want to refresh my um, – I did want to refresh my, my knowledge on it, and that's now what I want to do with you guys. Kate Eleanor says, great to be with you again. So um, are you guys happy with that? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to sort of address the story of, or this idea or this question of do aliens exist? Uh, what, what UFOs have been seen through the Roswell incident? And I'm not going to do it through... Uh, really any specific news source. We're going to do it in a very generic way. And you might say, you might argue and say, I, I don't really agree with that news source. All I really want us to agree with is, isn't this basically the um, epicenter of UFO law? And did you know that this is what happened there? That's basically what you want to do. Brooke says, I agree with you, but the fallen angels are the fallen angels. Okay. Uh, Mel Stiller says, the question for me is, why are we so captivated by the idea of not being alone in the universe? Well, I think uh, that's that's also quite an important question. I think, um, I think there are times that we do feel we need a little help. Like as a species, we are perhaps in over our heads. We're getting ourselves into trouble. Uh, we are um, sometimes a few degrees away from disaster. The doomsday clock, after all, is not very far from midnight often. Um, and so we sort of feel like maybe there's someone out there that can kind of, um, you know, um, steer us in the right direction. I do want to address that question in a more deep way, which is I don't think people really realize the terror and the horror of if aliens did exist and if they had the power to reach us. And if you were saying, um, please, please, please uh, come to Earth. Uh, we, we're here, over here, over here. If aliens did come here, I don't, don't think people appreciate the horror of what that would actually entail. Um, a very, very powerful species not like us coming to our world and really do you think they're going to be giving us hugs um and I'll, I'll 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 talk to you a little bit more about why uh the likelihood of it being a um a holocaust is is real i'll talk to you guys about that okay let's just go through a couple more comments um uh, joe says it might discredit religion um Kate says, okay, I think maybe it's time to start off with the Roswell incident. Okay. As you can see, I'm just looking at the very generic version on Wikipedia. And yeah, you have the, um, the headline. RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region, right? And it is dated um, July 8th, 1947. And um, here it says, no details of flying discs, flying disc are revealed. Roswell hardware man and wife report disc seen. See if we can go into that article in a little bit more detail. Uh, it says, the, the intelligence office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the field has come into possession of a flying saucer. That's pretty unambiguous, isn't it? A flying saucer was found. Uh, there you have it. According to information released by the department over authority of... Let me read that again. According to information released by the department... Over authority of Major J.A. Marcel, intelligence officer, the disc was recovered on a ranch in the Roswell vicinity. After an unidentified rancher had notified Sheriff Geo Wilcox here that he had found the instrument on his premises. Major Marcel and a detail from his department went to the ranch and recovered the disc, it was stated. After the intelligence office here had inspected the instrument, 
it was, and that's where the article sort of ends, right? And so the, the that information has been with us since 1947, right? And so let's kind of dig into it in a little bit more detail. Is there anyone here that is very familiar with the, the Roswell incident that sort of knows it um, like the back of their hand? Anyone here? Mel still says, I remember those headlines from my documentary. Anyone here that, that really knows the details of the Roswell incident off the back of their hand? Lo Lois says, pretty familiar, not an expert. So, Lois, I'm hoping that you're going to learn a little bit here. I know when I went through this, I was quite surprised. Uh, Elizabeth says, I read about it. But but quite a few of you say, no. Uh, Graciela says, heard, watched it million. Kate says, never heard of it. So, um, you know, there were quite a few of you who said, that you believe aliens exist, but there are also quite a few of you are saying you don't really know that much about the Roswell incident. Maybe now is a good time that we we um, become familiar with it, right? Ben says, I, I vaguely remember some details. So, so let's try and get clarity on some of those details, and that might help us think critically, certainly on this perspective of the whole alien encounters thing are you guys with me okay so i'm gonna now just read the very generic narrative on the roswell incident it's a really long narrative so i'm not going to read all of it um you know there, there's a lot of intrigue and um what do you call it um uh sort of subtext but we, we'll read basically the most important things Okay, are you guys ready? Let me make the text bigger. Can you guys see that? So here we have it. The Roswell incident is a collection of events, right? Not just a singular event, but, but actually a collection of events and myths. That's quite important. They already acknowledging in the first sentence that, that there's some information here that, that's not true, that, that's rumors surrounding the 1947 crash of a United States Army Air Forces balloon near Roswell, Mexico. So there you have it in the very first sentence that that is what they say it is. And, you know, I guess it's at this point that you either take it or leave it. You either say, um, I don't believe it. That, that that just said in the on that article, which you see on the right-hand side there, flying saucer. So how can you say it's a flying saucer, but then, then you also say it's a weather balloon? And that's a legitimate question, but let's try and get a legitimate answer, right? So um, how can I put this? Uh, maybe we should come back to this uh, opening opening sentence at the end of the narrative and say, was it true after all? But um, basically what they're saying here is that it was a, a USA Air Force balloon. And let me ask a really simple question. Was there a U.S. Air Force base or is there a U.S. Air Force base in Roswell? Just a simple question, yes or no. Is there, is there a U.S. Air Force base in New Mexico? And the reason why you ask a silly question like that is if it was if there was a US Army base in say California, you could say, well, why is this object in New Mexico? Right? I mean, how is it related? And you know, if, if someone said, Okay, well, the weather balloon got blown by the weather to where it was seen in New Mexico, you might say, Yeah, that, that is a bit hard to believe. On the other hand, if the weather balloon is some kind of experimental technology from this Air Force space would actually make sense that maybe something went wrong and whatever. But what still doesn't make sense is a weather balloon and a flying saucer that they seem to be totally two different things, right? Let me say that again. A weather balloon, which you'd imagine is sort of like a round 
round object, like spherical and like like a ball, um, is very different to a saucer, which is kind of like a flat uh, object, and and you'd imagine it's kind of metallic. So they they seem to be contradictions. I mean, either it's a, a balloon or it's a saucer. Either it's a saucer or it's a balloon, right? And I want to put that text in. Uh, I want to emphasize that text. Sorry, Timmy, I'm going to type something out. I want to emphasize that text because sometimes the, the silliest question is actually the opposite question, right? So what is it? A weather balloon and a saucer are completely different, right? Okay, so so we're going to come back to that the statement and see where it gets us. So, uh, Honey Duke mentions uh, something about they are not from outer space. Uh, they've always been here on Earth. Um, there's certainly a theory around that that I, I tend to subscribe to. Uh, but I think we'll try and get to that a little bit later. Um, it is called panspermia. Um, which is a thesis that states that the seeds of life exist all over the universe. Um, but we can talk about that um, maybe a little bit later. Okay, let's let's continue with the Roswell incident. Titanic discussions. Kubrick, speaking about 2001 The Space Odyssey, said, if Earth's evolution is 4 billion years old, imagine a similar planet that has evolved for 4 billion years. One million years and how advanced they would be compared to us. That's a fantastic observation. Fantastic observation. Another thing that's really interesting to think about is, you know, when I was in Namibia, I, I did encounter someone from the Himba tribe. It was a lady with clay in her hair and quite, quite uh, pretty. Um, and she had a child with her and she was like topless. And um, you, you kind of, got a sense that, you know, once upon a time, people, uh, us, we, we lived in a very tribal way, and we would even appear as aliens to our own species, um, you know, with our cell phones, it would appear to be magic to them and our vehicles. I'm just saying, if you lived in a mud hut, and you made, every day just made fire and you hunted, all our equipment, electricity, televisions, cars, um, cell phones, the internet w would seem literally like magic, like something from an alien world to people without, without it being alien whatsoever. Okay, so let's, um, let's get back to this narrative. So that is the um, opening explanation for what this is, that uh, it was a crash of a United States Army Air Force balloon. And I think that that's an important word to highlight crash, meaning that that this object that was recovered um, wasn't meant to crash. It was, was wasn't meant to just some kind of aerial instrument or uh, craft that was supposed to do something and failed and crashed. And and then the debris was retrieved. Guess what? In this analysis, we can actually look at a photograph of that craft being retrieved, which should put you into no doubt what it is, right? Let me say that again. In this analysis, we're going to look at a photograph, not kidding. <laughs> we're going to look at a photograph of that particular thing that was retrieved, and you, you are going to be no doubt what it is. Well, I, I, I assume you won't be. We'll see. Okay, so let's deal with this. Uh, operated from the nearby Alamogordo Army Airfield. How do you say that? Alamogordo Army Airfield and part of the top secret project Mogul. 
the balloon's purpose was remote detection of Soviet nuclear tests. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think in 1947, and, and I assume some of you here have watched the movie Oppenheimer, and I actually did mean to do my own video on that as well some time ago, but I assume some of you here have watched Oppenheimer. I've watched it. Alama Gordo. Thanks, Nan. Um, was uh, the possibility of other countries testing nuclear weapons uppermost in the minds of the American military at that time? So um, Earth says something there. L let's try and just for, for an hour concentrate on the Roswell incident because that's going to help you understand all these other incidents. Uh, well, I, I, I hope so, put it that way. Anyway, let me get back to what I was saying. If you watched Oppenheimer, then you know uh, that there was a heck of a lot of work being done in, uh, the, in, in, in terms of nuclear research, which ultimately led to the uh, building and detonation of not one but two atom bombs. And, um, and so just two years after that, two years after the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, what they're saying is they, were, they built a balloon that was meant to fly over Russia and, and to check whether the Russians were doing similar tests. Now, does that story sound uh, likely or reasonable? Certainly in terms of the timeline, it, it sounds uh, contextually, um, I guess, appropriate, one could say. Uh, the other thing that we can bear in mind is some of you may know that a Chinese balloon was was shot down over America really in the last couple of months, maybe maybe about a year ago. A year ago. So, you know, if you're going to scoff at the idea of these balloons, and, and you might call them weather balloons, but maybe they're actually, um, well, balloons, but not ostensibly to study the weather. Um, you know, obviously, can you see it says they're part of the top secret project mogul, right? Now, um, if it's top secret, well, you're not going to say that it's top secret. Now you, you might be able to do that. But at the time, could you say that it's top secret? And so I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. Um, uh, so you would call something like this that's floating around that is actually top secret, but there it is. Oh, well, it's just a weather balloon. Well, it's actually not. It's not a weather balloon. But going from it's not a weather balloon to aliens exist is quite a jump if you think about it. You might say it's true. That is definitely not a weather balloon, but that doesn't mean it's a, that aliens exist. You guys, you guys follow. As Diane says, they are basically surveillance balloons, right? So uh, are things starting to fall into place for you guys? Okay, so let's go back to this. The balloon's purpose was remote detection of Soviet nuclear tests. Well, when they say remote detection, I think they mean from the air, right? After metallic and rubber debris was recovered by Roswell Army Airfield personnel, the United States announced their possession of a flying disc. Well, there you have it. So, wow, there's also a flying disc. What, what's going on here? And this is where, I guess, imaginations start running around. You know, uh, could a UFO have collided with this balloon? Um, could this balloon have actually detected the UFO and there was some kind of thing going on? What, what's going on here? And so... This announcement made. <clears throat> let me just. So you can see the part that's sticking out here is the word "flying disc," and you had that that come out over here as well. Flying saucer, flying disc. Can you see my cursor um, hovering over here? Uh, captures flying saucer, flying disc. And then, yeah, they also talk about a flying disc. And so they say they announced their possession of a flying disc. And so, um, you know, it's 
by their own acknowledgement, they say we we are in possession of the flying disc. Now, what else are you going to think except to say, isn't that a flying saucer? And flying saucers are UFOs, aren't they? Kind of thing. And so this announcement made international headlines, but was retracted within a day. And so you've got this weird thing going on where it makes the news, but then the news unnewses it. A little bit like the fake Mother's Day photo of Kate Middleton. And so the whole un, uh, or, you know, killing the photo makes it ten times, a thousand times more newsworthy than it ever would have been. And so you have the same thing happening here. Uh, we saw a flying disc. Oh, hang on, no, no, no. We didn't see a flying disc. Now suddenly it is um, this big conspiracy, a big cover-up. Uh, it says here, obscuring the true purpose and source of the crashed balloon, the army subsequently stated that it was a conventional weather balloon. And so that then makes one automatically suspicious. It's clearly not just a weather balloon. Something else is going on here. What is going on here? Okay. So now we're going to just deal with this 1947 flying disc craze. Now, I do know, um, you know, I was born in the, the what was it, 1947. Um I was born in the 70s and there was a period in my life where um, not certainly not, um, you, you know, you didn't have the internet then, but you, you saw a lot of video and there were, there were some magazines just showing um, grainy images of things that looked like um, flying saucers. But then the, you'd also see things where people had literally taken saucepans or saucepan lids and, and kind of made um, what we think of as fake now, but, but like then it was basically a lot of counterfeit footage of things that looked like UFOs and it really looked pretty, um, pretty real. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of going on certainly in my youth. And so there have been periods where people have been very um, kind of aware of the UFO thing and then it, it sort of fluctuates. And, and I would say we in that period again. I, I think there's a lot of interest in it kind of at the moment. Okay, so in 1978, retired Air Force officer Jesse Marcel revealed that the Army's weather balloon claim had been a cover story. Is that a, is that a shock to hear that? But added to that, that is speculation that the debris uh, was of extraterrestrial origin. So remember at the beginning of the story, it says um, the Roswell incident is a collection of events and myths. So it's events that really did happen, but then also something else that perhaps didn't happen. And so here you have the weather balloon claim had been a cover story. I'm sure that that's true and it makes sense. But then he says that the debris was of extraterrestrial origin. Now, of course, the fact that he's an Air Force officer gives, gives us quite a lot of credibility. You know, maybe he knows something that hasn't been revealed. Um, popularized by the 1980 book, The Roswell Incident. Um, now it's quite interesting that this book came out in 1980, two years after this guy retired. Um, this speculation became the basis for long lasting and increasingly complex and contradictory UFO conspiracy theories. So um, this is really where it all started. You know, if you think about it, the whole UFO, whatever you want to call it, religion, mythology, uh, science, belief, whatever you want to call it, uh, whatever you say when you say aliens exist or aliens don't exist, whatever you want to call that, um, it really started in 1980 with this book, The Roswell Incident, and it seemed to be based on something authentic. And that's why, like when I drove to Roswell, I thought, what really did happen here? Because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of um, obvious 
references to UFOs and aliens in Roswell. Um, funny enough, although I went to the Rocket Museum and well, there was a rocket uh, exhibition, I never actually made it to Area 51. It was just too far out the way. Um, anyway, but there you have it. Um, this book really uh, spurned a lot of the um, conspiracy theories. And over time, you know, for the last almost 45 years, they've expanded to include governments concealing evidence of extraterrestrial beings, gray aliens, right? Shall we have a look at that very quickly? What, what is a gray alien? Oh, there it is. Um, multiple crash flying sources. Let's have a look at that. So here are a couple of images of flying saucers. And another one. McMinnville UFO photos from 1950. Is that a extraterrestrial or is that the top of a saucepan? Is that a UFO or is that a cloud? And so you also had things like comics and, um, you know, popular media, uh, TV programs um, pushing this whole thing. So obviously you have an idea and then it gets uh, reinforced with um, mythology, with publications, with, um, you know, documentaries, with all sorts of reimaginings. This is the October 1957 issue of Amazing Stories devoted to flying saucers. This is 10 years after the Roswell incident. Okay, let's go back to our story. So we're going to we're going to deal with the actual Roswell incident in a second. Um, but this is quite important, especially for the true crime folks among us. Uh, you know, we, we, we want to be fact based, evidence based, and we want to follow the evidence. So, and that's what they say, despite the lack of evidence, many UFO proponents claim that the Roswell debris was derived from an alien craft and accused the US government of a cover-up. The conspiracy narrative has become a trope in science fiction literature, film and television. And I'm sure you guys remember that trope in Independence Day, where um, the, there's an attack on, on Earth and the president ends up at, I think, Area 51. And guess what? They've got aliens kind of behind like a glass pane there. And they've been studying them for years. And uh, the president says, how, how did I not know about this? And the defense minister says, plausible deniability, Mr. President. Um, and then another guy says, you didn't really think um, a toilet seat costs $500 uh, or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's how it was paid for, etc. Anyway, um, the town of Roswell leverages this to promote itself as a destination for UFO associated tourism. Now, um, you might not think much of that. You might say, uh, why, whether it's true or not, what is wrong with Roswell um, uh, leveraging mythology or leveraging rumors or leveraging conspiracies 
what's wrong with that? It's all a little bit of fun. If you believe it, it's fun. Sorry, if you believe it, it's serious. If you don't, it's, it's just a bit of fun. What's the big deal? Um, I think there's a there's an answer to that question. Um, I'll I, th I think one way to deal with it is when we were traveling through Colorado, in fact, very close to the Great Sand Dunes, we found a place that was basically built as a UFO viewing site. It was like a, right next to the road, there's like a raised platform and basically a junkyard. Uh, I don't really have pictures with me. Um, I could probably find them for you. Maybe I'll put them on um, the community page after this video. But basically you see kind of wire uh, versions of, of uh, UFOs uh, and, and also of aliens. And, and the idea is that you, you, you come there and you stand on the platform and you look at the sky and obviously there's nothing in the sky, but you, you look around, but it's kind of a stop on the way to where you're going. And the reason why this um, platform is there, someone owns a farm there, but the farm wasn't making any money. And so they tried this gimmick and it worked. You know, they, they tried to, so obviously to stand on the platform, I think you've got to pay $5 and, um, and, and, and the UFO t-shirts you can buy and all sorts of things. And they've obviously made enough money for it to be a going concern. There's also a story inside that structure where they talk about a horse where they did experiment. It looks like a horse uh, lost all of its um, uh, meat or tissue. And they're saying that was done by aliens. And an alien came down and stripped this horse of all of its, um, you know, tissue um, because a person couldn't have done that, something like that. And so that's part of the folklore in that area. And now, um, but, but anyway, that is just a brief background into the context of the Roswell incident. Now let's look at the specifics. Now let's look at the actual evidence. Uh, what are some of your comments? I think that if beings in the aerial vehicles appear alien, it's because they're remote controlled robots. Okay. Some of you guys are really jumping the gun here. So what I want to try and uh, encourage you guys to do is let's not talk about aliens just yet. Let's talk about UFOs. Um, are we seeing UFOs or not? So, so let's not talk about aliens just yet. Now, I, I do think that's one of the weaknesses in the whole UFO thing is we are very quick to let our imaginations run and very slow to say, hold on a second, what do we know for a fact about that? What do we know for a fact about that? As you say, uh, English uh, Bottle Cap says, many 1960s TV series featured flying saucers, absolutely. Uh, Trent says he thinks it's laughable that people may think that we're alone. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to deal with the evidence of the Roswell incident. Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready to expand your minds, right? Here we go. In 1947, the United States had launched thousands of top-secret Project Mogul balloons carrying devices to listen for Soviet atomic tests. Um, I think I need to emphasize that. The, the United States didn't just launch a balloon. They launched thousands, thousands of balloons, not a thousand, thousands a plural of thousand. So what we're talking about is lots and lots of balloons. Now I know what you're thinking. That still doesn't explain a flying saucer. But uh, bear with me. Let's let's go further into this. On June fourth, researchers at Alamogordo uh, Army Airfield. How did I do there? Launched a long train of these balloons. Right. 
So I guess this is a little bit like Starlink, like a lot of not satellites linked together, but actually uh, balloons linked together. They lost contact within 17 miles, 27 kilometers of Mac Brazel's ranch, where the balloon subsequently crashed. Later that month, Brazel discovered tinfoil, rubber, tape, and thin wooden beams scattered across several acres of his ranch. Now, let me ask you, um, th does that sound like alien design, like like alien, uh, how can I put it, um, alien um, material, you know, like a, a very um, advanced type of uh, alien um uh, shielding for, for craft that need to go uh, into and out of the atmosphere and, and, and go at a great speed through the universe. Uh, something that's made out of tin foil, rubber, tape, and thin wooden beams. Th does that seem like the kind of material you'd, you'd build like a stealth bomber out of? What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> Robbie says, no, it sounds like DIY material. Okay, let's go a bit further. Amid the first summer of the Cold War, um, press nationwide covered Kenneth Arnold's June 24th account of what became known as Flying Saucers. Uh, objects which allegedly perform maneuvers beyond the capabilities of any known aircraft. And so, um, just trying to look at the dates here, June 4th, and, and I think we are dealing with and June 24th, June 4th and June 24th. So I don't know if this is three weeks later, three weeks after this incident, this story has shot around the world, right? Um, publicity of Arnold's report incited a wave of over 800 sightings. So this to me is where it gets really interesting and where I think it, educates us a little bit on the nature and the, um, what do you call it? The, it's not the proclivities, but the, starts with a P. Um, but anyway, the, um, the, the way that human psychology tends to play out. So what I'm getting at is you have a um, sighting let, and let's say it's legitimate. Let, let, let's say the sighting on um, just, I just want to make absolutely sure when this news report came out. Um, Ju July 18, 1947, that was when it was in the paper, right? But you basically, around the time that something became known, Suddenly, people were seeing flying saucers all over the place. And so let me ask you a question. Do you think there were flying saucers all over the place? Or do you think because people were primed to think about them, they were seeing things when they weren't quite sure what they were? And hasn't that been the case ever since? So in other words, um, I went on a ghost tour once, where, and I don't believe in ghosts, but the whole idea was that you, you, you would be told that area is haunted and then you would kind of get the sense that that sound and that the wind blowing there and you kind of became like hypersensitive to literally everything and because you prime to see ghosts you tend to see ghosts or you certainly tend to see something and the same applies to anything you know if you um in a hypnosis scenario anyway let, let's let's move on a little bit from that so um, why is it that after this became a news event, suddenly everyone was seeing UFOs? And I mean, it's all over the, the news media, right? So it's almost the same as when someone uh, is a fugitive, when, when there's a all-points bulletin and someone is on the run and 
it's in the in the news, then you'll have thousands of tips going in, and only five percent or even one percent are real. Or it's because people are suddenly taking notice around them, but are they really seeing anything of any um, evidentially evidentiary value, right? In other words, it's like seeing is believing. You're told to see something, so you see it. If you weren't told to see it, you wouldn't see it. But you, what you're told to see, you're seeing, right? Um, okay, let's go on. Press accounts speculated that the disc sightings might be the result of atomic research or rocket tests at government facilities such as New Mexico's White Sands and Alamogordo. Now, um, that's not, that's not uh, necessarily true or not true. So where the press say these disks are uh, to do with atomic research or rocket tests, it's not necessarily true. Uh, the, the, those um, devices may have nothing to do with rocket tests and may have nothing to do with atomic research. It may have to do with surveillance or somebody else. Um, but it's very really hard not to think. And I couldn't help thinking when I was going through Roswell, I was thinking, Hang on. The first rockets in the world were tested at Roswell. Well, then it makes absolute sense that aliens, if they existed, would want to come and look around there. It would make absolute sense that if aliens were hovering around our world, they'd be really interested to know in how good we are getting at getting off our world, right? It would kind of make sense. And it turns out the first rockets were tested in Roswell. Anyway, let's go back to this. With no phone or radio, Brazil was initially unaware of the ongoing flying disc craze, but he was told about it when visiting his uncle in Corona, New Mexico, on July 5th. The next day, he informed Sheriff George Wilcox of the debris he had found. Wilcox called Roswell Army Air, uh, Airfield, who assigned Major Jesse Marcel and Captain Sheridan Cabot to return with Brazil and gather the material from the ranch. On July 8th, this is, I think, three days after that newspaper article. The RAAF public information officer issued a press release stating that the military had recovered a flying disc near Roswell. And that is what's causing all of this sort of brouhaha. You have the military literally stating in black and white, we found a flying disc. And so it's it's a real problem. I thought you said it's a weather balloon, flying disc, weather balloon, weather balloon, flying disc. Which one is it? Let's see if we can hear what this is about. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Russia has demanded UN action to get all foreign military personnel out of Greece. Southern soft coal operators have not yet reached agreement with John L. Lewis, but the rest of the soft coal industry has resumed production. The House of Representatives has passed the tax reduction bill by more than the two-thirds which would be required to override a veto. Headline edition will bring you special reports and interviews in a moment. The American Broadcasting Company and affiliated stations present Headline Edition with Taylor Grant from all over the world, wherever the disc report of today's significant action in the UN Security Council. ...that one of the strange discs had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucer. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, is 
reports that it has received one of the discs which landed on a ranch outside Rockwell. The disc landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brizel was the man who discovered the topper. Colonel William Blanchard of the Rockwell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disc looked like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying chopper to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. In the meantime, General Ramey describes the object as being of flimsy construction, almost like a box type. He says that it was so battered that he was unable to determine whether it had a disc form, and he does not indicate its size. Ramey says that so far as can be determined, no one saw the object in the air, and he describes it as being made of some sort of tinfoil. Other Army officials say that further information indicates that the object had a diameter of about 20 to 25 feet, and that nothing in the apparent construction indicated any capacity for speed, and that there was no evidence of a power plant. The disc also appeared too flimsy to carry a man. Now, back to Taylor Grant in New York. So, what do you make of that? So, we sort of get told that there's, there is a disc. The disc seems to be made of tin foil. The disc seems to be very flimsy, which are all quite, quite specific descriptions. Also, that the, the disc is kind of a lightweight material that probably couldn't carry a man. So how, how can that be a flying saucer? Because you would imagine a flying saucer would be made of some kind of metal or some kind of, um, um, you know, combination of metals or, or, or some material that is not flimsy and um, could carry some weight, right? So w w what is going on here? Do we... Do, so when you listen to that, do you do you listen to that and say, you know what, it doesn't make sense. So so that is a lion's propaganda, or do you say, hold on a second, can this can this tie in with an actual balloon? Because balloons can't pick up very heavy weight. So are, are we dealing with something that is actually kind of a weather something? related to a weather balloon because weather balloons do tend to be made of I won't say tin foil but but sort of light materials right so I'd be interested to hear what your response is to that news report fake news uh, you know big government propaganda they, they, they're telling stories that are certainly not true or it is true but we can't quite figure out what that truth is. What do you think is the answer? Nan says no telling. Okay. Well, all, all will be revealed quite soon. Robert Porter, an RAAF flight engineer, was part of the crew loaded what he was told he was told was a flying saucer onto the flight bound for Fort Worth Army Airfield. He described the material packaged in wrapping paper when he received it as lightweight and not too large to fit inside the trunk of a car. That's quite interesting. So now we now we told that the flying saucer is basically as big as a suitcase. So that kind of changes things. Um, you know, if the flying saucer is about the size of the saucer above my head then it's, it really is carrying little green men, right? It really is carrying little green men. So, so we're told that the, the saucer is small, lightweight, so you can pick it up, um, and it seems to be made of tinfoil or something like tinfoil. What are we dealing with here? Is this all a myth, or, or um, is all of this actually accurate? After station director George Walsh broke the news over Roswell radio station KSWS and related to the Associated Press, his phone lines were overwhelmed. He later recalled, all afternoon I tried to call Sheriff Wilcox for more information. 
but could never get through to him. Media people called me from all over the world. And so this is um, from an Associated Press article, July 8th, 1947. Um, what do you think this looks like? Um, you know, they described a material that kind of looks like tin foil and is lightweight, but maybe they mistook it for some space age uh, thing that is actually something else. What does this actually look like to you? And th th those are the, I think, the pieces of wood that they were talking about. What, uh, when, when you look at that, does, does it look like uh, part of a flying saucer? It's quite interesting that the look on his face, he, he, he doesn't look, um, he looks kind of amused, doesn't he? Um, Christine says man-made materials. Robbie Robbins says a lantern. Um, Jalsi says aluminium foil. By the way, Jalsi, I'd, I'd also like to hear your story. I, I believe you've got, you have one. Okay. So, Let's just quickly do a little assessment. Are you guys learning something here? Have you uh, learned something about Roswell that you didn't know before? Are you, um, is your knowledge being enhanced? I hope so. Earth says it looks staged. All of these are like true crime terms, right? Uh, good, good to hear, Terry. Um, Okay, so let's continue. The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality. So get that rumors. Oh, damn, it's doing this again. Um, rumors. Rumors are becoming reality. Are all of them becoming reality? So, you know, they, they spoke about debris and now they've got a photograph. They spoke about something and now they've got a photograph. Are all the rumors becoming reality? So, the, you know, the, uh, is it, are there aliens? Is there a UFO? Or is it a case that, yes, something did really happen? Something did crash into a farmhouse. And this is some of the materials that were found. So it's true, the rumors are becoming reality, but definitely not all of them, some of them. Um, when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranches and the sheriff's office of Chavez County, the flying object landed on a, on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Not having phone facilities, the ranch has stored the disc until such time as he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Major Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Okay. So another thing, and here's another image of it. Uh, do these uh, officers look terrified? Do these officers look like this is a, a really serious thing that's taking place? Again, uh, does that look like um, advanced alien technology? Does this, this, this look like um, the sort of thing human beings could, 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 could learn to use, maybe, on their own aircraft? 
Look at the expressions on both these officers' faces. Um, they seem very amused, not even slightly amused. They, it seems very funny to them. Uh, Lois says it looks like a kite homemade. Um, Timmy says this is the media cover up. Well, is it is it the media covering up because the media are actually telling the story that, that they and, and I mean they basically say here that they've found a, a disc and they and it's a flying object. Um, how are the media covering it up? I mean, aren't they saying that they found a flying saucer? So who who is really covering something up? But anyway, let's take it a bit further. Media interest in the case dissipated soon after a press conference where General Roger Ramey, his chief of staff, Colonel Thomas Dubois, or is that Dubose, and weather officer Irving Newton identified the materials as pieces of a weather balloon. So um, you can almost see how this is like a kill notice for the story. Nothing to see here. Uh, uh, it's not UFOs. It's just a weather balloon. And there, there is some truth, I think, in being suspicious of that, to say, is it a weather balloon? Was it a weather balloon? But then I also think one's got to be careful saying, okay, it's, if it's not a weather balloon, does that make it a UFO? And so where is the truth between those two extremes? Um, Newton told reporters that similar radar targets were used at about 80 weather stations across the country. And this is why I say, you know, people think that this was a freak thing that happened, but actually it wasn't. Um, a lot of the same kind of craft and material were being used all over. Remember I said thousands of these balloons were launched. Well, um, we're going to see one of them in a moment. The small number of subsequent news stories offered mundane and prosaic accounts of the crash. On July 9th, the Roswell Daily Record highlighted that no engine or metal parts had been found in the wreckage. Um, would, would you think that that is kind of quite important? So the first thing that starts to change your reality is you say, oh, okay, so, so it's kind of made of tin foil okay and and then it can also fit into the trunk of a car so it's actually quite small and then the next one is that there are actually no metal parts whatsoever uh, okay well it can't be very harmful then could it So um, we we could we could spend an hour talking about or arguing about what what we're talking about here, um, but as far as I'm concerned, it's quite clear. Um, aren't we talking about something that you you don't know, and so you think it comes from an alien planet? Right, so so it's an it, it is an unidentified object that is is or was in the air, and I must say, I always find this um, kind of annoying, where you say let's not make the discussion about do UFOs exist. Let's argue about what we call them. Can't we just agree that we're talking about UFOs? Um, we're talking about things that are in the sky that we're not sure what they are, and I mean literally this story is about something that came out of the sky that there's some disagreement about what it really is. So is it okay? I mean, is it okay for the purpose of this analysis to call them UFOs or do we need to stop? Maybe I, I can change the name in the title of this video and then we can start thinking about it. Like, like, do we need to, can't we just um, move beyond that? If you know what I'm saying. What does um, Deborah say? Deborah says, 
I think what we were shown in public is completely different to what they really found. They had to show us something. And that is a very um, uh, understandable thing to, to think, to, to say, this is, so, this is all so silly. Uh, what kind of fools do they think we are, right? Or, or, or maybe it is true. And maybe the joke is kind of on us. And that is why these officers, like here, are smiling. And here. This is what you want to, what all the fuss is about, really? This is, this is what you want to take a photo of? It's a good point, uh, Helena. So, um, whatever you want to call it, you, you can call it UAEs or UAVs or UFOs or whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing in the, in the context of uh, when you see something that you can't identify, does that mean it's a, does that mean it's alien? Um, right? If you see something that you're not sure what it is, you're seeing an, you're seeing an alien. Should you call 911? Right? Um, so, anyway, there you have it. No engine or metal parts were found. Uh, Brazil told the record that the debris consisted of rubber strips, tinfoil paper, tape, and sticks. So, yeah, you've got somebody else confirming what just said um, earlier. Um, where is it? Where are you? I can't find it now, but there was apparently another reference to what was inside it. There, there it is, uh, lightweight and not too large to fit. I can't, I can't really find the rest of it. Anyway, uh, Brazil said he paid little attention to it, but later returned with his wife and daughter to gather up some of the debris. When interviewed in Fort Worth, Texas, Marcel described the wreckage as parts of the weather device composed of tin foil and broken wooden beams and that is what it looks like isn't it and so um you know we do have to wonder does deborah have a point um is this actually kind of um the air force giving you something and something ridiculous and saying well this is what it was, but it, it actually was something else, right? Is that what, what is actually going on here? What do you think? So let's do a quick poll. How many of you think that what was seen and described, we're talking about evidence now, evidence that was collected, evidence that was shown, evidence that was described. Do you, do you believe that it is as it was photographed or not? So yes, I think it was, or no, I still believe in UFOs. We were talking earlier, well, we need to see proof. We need some more informa information about it. Now that we've been given the information, do we believe it? Hmm. English bottle cup cap says no and no. Earth says I don't believe it. Sandra says yes. But quite a, quite a few no's. Quite a few no's. Okay. 
Um, Mel says, yes, it was a weather balloon. Kate says, this is complex. Okay, let's find out what this is. The 1947 official account omitted any connection to Cold War military programs. Well, you can, you can understand why. Because they were in the middle of a Cold War. In, in a war situation, you, you don't reveal your hand, right? On July 10, military personnel at Alamogordo gave a misleading demonstration to the press. So that seems to be um, acknowledged that they did mislead the press. Four officers provided a false account of mundane weather balloon usage throughout the previous year. And so there is something to the notion that the military were misleading, manipulating the public. Does that mean aliens exist? So, yes, there was a false account. But was this within a Cold War situation with very high stakes, nuclear weapons and also um, uh, what's the other thing? Yeah, basically a war situation and nuclear weapons that are being um, developed. Uh, why can't you just say we were spying on Russia and we want to see whether they've got nuclear weapons? Why couldn't you just say that? Right? Why, why couldn't the military just say, busted, we were spying on the Russians. We Why couldn't they say that? Because you're in the middle of a freaking Cold War. And you know what? Where the Cold War eventually went to, not that long later, or the Cuban Missile Crisis and all that kind of thing, right? Okay, so anyway, um, they demonstrated the balloon configurations that used many of the unusual configurations employed by the Mogul team as ways to gather meteorological data, offering a plausible explanation for any unusual aspects of the Roswell debris. So they are offering a plausible explanation, but um, it's not really the real explanation. Major Wilbur D. Uh, Pritchard, then stationed at Alamogordo Army Airfield, would later describe the weather balloon story as an attempt to deflect attention from the top secret mogul project. Now, does this make sense? Or are you still kind of thinking, I don't know what happened here? You know, so far we've gone through some of the narrative. Does this make sense to you? Are you thinking, no, 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 the whole thing is a conspiracy. UFOs do exist. What do you, what do you, we, we, are, we are your minds at this point. And so in the midst of all of this, you have UFO conspiracy theories basically filling in that hole. So the hole is that the military aren't going to tell you exactly what they're doing. And you can clearly see it's not a weather balloon. And there is clear description of a flying saucer. And so the UFO conspiracy theorists can fill that hole with whatever they want. And there's just enough there for it to really catch on, for people to say, I see what you're saying. And the only possible explanation for this is extraterrestrials. That makes complete sense. And so what you actually have taking place here, and you can kind of you kind of get a sense of that in Roswell, is how much money can be made out of playing with this idea that 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 there are aliens amongst us. You can see how people want to believe it. You can see how people are uh, titillated and activated and triggered and interested in this subject. And so guess what? There's money to be made out of it. And if I was sitting here, right, if I was sitting here and my, if you could see like a thought bubble above my head and the thought bubble was, I'm going to make a, a, a video about UFOs, but my, what is my purpose in making the video? Is my purpose in being an authentic channel that is about reality and about uh, thinking critically, right? Is that my purpose? Or is my purpose to to cynically make money out of you guys, 
to try and profit out of um, just the sort of psychological interest in are we alone in the universe? Well, we, 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 which strategy would I employ? Which strategy would I employ to make money? Well, I would use the strategy of saying, you know what, I actually think there's a lot of evidence that shows there are aliens out there. And this I don't believe in terms of Roswell, and this I do believe, and basically push the whole thing, right? And um, instead of having 185 people watching, maybe there'd be a lot more people watching because that this would be shocking and exciting and titillating. But the story where you say, well, what the evidence shows is blah, blah, blah. You know, it's not really that exciting. It looks like tinfoil was used. Um, that's not going to um, be incredibly interesting. It's going to be a little bit disappointing. And so can you see the difference? And so in the same way, people who, who push UFO conspiracy theories sell books. They make documentaries. They have little platforms in the desert that make money, right? By selling this myth and people some people who take it seriously take it seriously and some people who don't have fun with it but um my my issue with the whole thing is how good are we at thinking critically and i think the ufo thing is an example of our ability our inability to to know how to think about things uh our inability to know how to deal with um popular ideas um that are actually um not true right okay so let's deal with some of the ufo conspiracy theories from um 1947 to 1978 so for 31 years so the roswell incident remained obscure for three decades Reporting on the incident ceased soon after the government provided a mundane explanation and broader reporting on flying saucers declined rapidly after the twin fall saucer hoax. So you literally had hoaxes trying to use the excitement and the momentum to generate their own saucer hoax. So essentially you could argue that Roswell was a, a, an accidental or... Um, not deliberate saucer hoax. But then someone saw that and said, what if we deliberately did a saucer hoax and we got people to say, you know, to witness certain things, uh, we could have the same kind of um, traction um, with something that is under our own control. You know, we could invent a story. And, and then you have this, the twin false saucer hoax. So here you have on July 12, 1947, the U.S. Army released photos of hoaxed flying discs recovered from Twin Falls. So there's some kind of disc, I guess. Can you see this officer is also kind of smiling? Now, do you think he's smiling because he's evil or do you think is just a officer who is actually amused by all of the silliness. Would you also be smiling under these circumstances? Okay, anyway, let's go back to this. Um, you guys want me to go through the all of these hoaxes? Or do you guys want me to reveal what this weather balloon actually was like a photo of it so it says here nevertheless belief in a ufo cover-up by the u.s government became widespread in this period and I, I think it's very hard to think about roswell or area 51 without thinking about government cover-up um, it's part of the mythology, and, and it's part of the mythology for a reason, because there was legitimately something of a cover-up. During Roswell's decades of obscurity, a UFO mythology developed fueled by hoaxes, legends, and stories 
of crashed spaceships and alien bodies in New Mexico. In 1947, many Americans attributed flying saucers to unknown military aircraft. In the decades between the initial debris recovery and the emergence of Roswell theories, flying saucers became synonymous with alien spacecraft. So that's the, that's the difference. Um, up until 1947, people saw things and they said that must be military. After that, they said, no, it must be an alien. And aliens fly in flying saucers. Trust in the US government declined and acceptance of conspiracy theories became widespread. Now, I really want to highlight that and pause on that for a moment. I really want to pause on this for a moment. There are a lot of conspiracy theories in true crime. Um, in the John Monet Ramsey case, there are many. Madeleine McCann case, there are many. But almost every single true crime case, there's also a conspiracy theory. There is what we know, what we know for a fact, and then there's a sort of um, life of, on its own conspiracy surrounding a case. Some of it's based on truth, a little bit, and then a lot of it's just whatever uh, people want to believe Whatever is going to make somebody some money, I guess. Somebody wants the story to continue, and so they basically manufacture information, right? What I what I think um, people don't appreciate. You you might say, oh, this is really interesting. Uh, did did Brian Koberger have an accomplice? Oh, this is really interesting. Um, uh, could Christian Bruckner have committed this crime and? He did lots of other things as well, and it's 10 times worse than you thought. Um, when you give yourself over to those conspiracies, when you say, wow, this is so interesting, um, I don't really need the evidence, let's hear the story. C could it be this? Could it be that? You tend to put your faith in someone that doesn't really provide you with evidence, or, or the way they provide you with evidence is simply by telling you something, by basically bullshitting. Um, you basically start to trust bullshitters and you start to distrust really the world around you. So in other words, the, it's all within the premise of you getting to know your world better. You, you are getting to understand what is really happening on our earth better. Guess what's actually happening? You are being duped. You are actually being uh, misled. You actually are learning how not to understand anything in your world you, you're actually being taken away from reality into um basically a series of rabbit holes right so what i'm trying to say is although if you are in this rabbit hole in your mind you feel like i'm i'm finding out what's really happening in this situation and in that one actually what's really happening is you're being taken out of the world that you know and you're basically being I guess milked for your for your um, lack of ability to discern the difference between reality and fiction, right? And so, guess who pays the price for that? You do. Guess who pays the price for that? Your community, because anyone around you that is is in touch with the real world is good for you, because it makes the world more a more effective place. By the same token. Anyone around you who doesn't know what's going on in the world and is duped by every scam that's going on, um, something happens on your phone without thinking about it, you click the next thing you signed up to, all sorts of things. Um, the more people that are impoverished by um, scams and hoaxes, the, the, the poorer our communities are, and um, the weaker um, the, the bonds are that, that exist between us. And that, that eventually leads to distrust of law enforcement, distrust of the government, and um, it basically weakens society. Is that what we want? Do we want a weakened society? Do we want weakened communities? Do we want weakened and compromised individuals? You might say, no, it's all fun. I, I like thinking about UFOs and so on. Maybe you should be thinking about what's happening in the world right now, like right in front of you, in your neighborhood. Are there crimes being committed? 
in your um, in your uh, what do you call it um, district um, things that are happening in our world right now maybe you should be paying attention to that right um, it also says here UFO believers accused the government of cosmic Watergate. The 1947 incident was interpreted, reinterpreted to fit the public's increasingly conspirational outlook. And so uh, what is very unfortunate about Roswell is you can understand that the government had good reasons to keep certain of the activities secret, right? And yet it has this horrible aftermath that, that basically leads, because the, the government are legitimately trying to protect their, their citizens against a real threat, nuclear weapons, right? Um, and that then leads to all of this um, fictional thinking. Anyway, let's go on to the next hoax, Aztec crash saucer hoax. The Aztecs New Mexico crash saucer hoax introduced. Should we have a look at that? An investigator for the Air Forces stated that three so called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, approximately 50 feet in diameter. Well, that's certainly not going to fit into your trunk of your vehicle. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Oh, so that's what the tin foil was for. The tin foil was actually the, the sort of um, bathrobe of these aliens. Thanks a lot, uh, Pico Pakanko. Thanks very much. Did I say that right? Um, so hang on. So so this foil here is was actually like a like an alien bathrobe. That's an alien bathrobe, guys. That that's kind of like uh, what are those dresses they they wore in the old days that sort of um, had like a tight corset and sort of ballooned outwards. Um, that's actually what the aliens were wearing. That, that's why there's pieces of sticks and so on. Oh, okay. So let's go back to this. Uh, each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. Oh, okay. So um, I've, I've seen photos of Neil Armstrong um, in like a very silver suit. I think he was testing the uh, – there it is. So I think this is what they're getting at, right? Uh, that um, that that silver uh, material is actually a spacesuit, just like that. Um, I'm not sure where the pieces of of wood are, but that's what it is. Uh, what else did I say? According to Mr. Someone, the saucer was, was found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has a very high-powered radar set up in the area, and it believed the radar interferes with the controlling mechanics of the sources. So there's your kind of narrative that's kind of developing around this. Quite, quite, uh, quite sly, if you ask me. Okay, and so that is the... Um, What was it? The Majestic 12 hoax, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I've got that wrong. Sorry, when I blow the text up, it does become a bit disorienting. Mm. 
Majestic 12 was the purported organization behind fake government documents delivered anonymously to multiple ufologists in the early 1980s. So now the fakery and the conspiracy theories are becoming organized, right? All individuals who received the fake documents were connected to Bill Moore. After the publication of the Roswell incident, Richard Doty and other individuals presenting themselves as Air Force intelligence officers approached Moore. They used the unfulfilled promise of hard evidence of extraterrestrial retrievals to recruit to recruit Moore, who kept notes on other ufologists and intentionally spread misinformation within the UFO community. At a 1989 mutual UFO network conference, Bill Moore confessed that he had intentionally fed fake evidence of extraterrestrials to UFO researchers. So let me ask you, um, uh, in that column, in, in this column, uh, you, you can write U.S. military or U.S. government. And then the question is, and there's a box in that column, did the U.S. government mislead people about what they found? And, and the answer is tick yes, they did. Okay, but, but that's not the end of the story. Ask the same question about the ufologists. Did the ufologists um, mislead people? Um, and, and I guess you could say in the same way. In other words, for the good of mankind, you know, because we are engaged in a cold war, whatever, um, did, the, um, did the ufologists mislead people for the greater good? And I would argue, no, they misled people in order to profit from their own deception, right? And you never hear really hear about that. You hear about how evil the government is. You hear about how evil the military is, how we are being tricked and manipulated, whatever. You don't hear about how evil and crafty and um, uh, dishonest the opportunists, the, these, these peddlers of conspiracy theories, you don't hear about them. You don't hear about them being dishonest. You don't hear about how much money they made, right? And that's kind of unfortunate. And I think the reason you don't hear about it is the people who um, are interested in all of that stuff um, don't want to admit that they were wrong, right? They're not going to put out a thing saying this guy is uh, is fake news because that would um, reflect on them. Uh, yeah, you have Doty would later say intentionally gave fabricated information to UFO researchers while working at Kirtland Air Force Base in the 1980s. Roswell conspiracy proponents turned on Moore, <coughs> but not on the broader conspiracy theory. The Majestic 12 materials have been heavily scrutinized and discredited. The various purported memos existed only as copies of photographs of documents. Carl Sagan criticized the complete lack of provenance of documents miraculously dropped on a doorstep like something out of a fairy story, perhaps the elves and the shoemaker. And there you have a, a very uh, authentic figure, a very respected figure that is um, interested in this topic. And does he believe it? Does he believe it because he wants to? Well, I'm sure he does want to believe it, but does he believe it because it's scientific? No, he, he doesn't believe it because it's not scientific. Researchers noted the idiosyncratic date format not found in government documents. So literally what you have here is folks taking government documents and doctoring them in order to make it leave like a paper trail and make it look like there were documented sightings of aliens. I mean, that is literally human beings lying to sucker other human beings. Uh, also telling other human beings kind of what they want to hear. In this variant of the Roswell legend, the bodies were ejected from the craft shortly before it exploded over the ranch. Have you guys heard that? The, the propulsion unit is destroyed and the government concludes the ship was a short-range reconnaissance craft. The following week, the bodies are recovered some miles away, decomposing from exposure and predators. I wonder if we can have a look at this.
This Air Force base here in Roswell, New Mexico, was the center of a controversy back in 1947, but over 40 years later still remains unsolved. Okay, well, I'm not going to play this. I'll probably get into trouble from YouTube, but you guys are welcome to watch it yourselves. Um, Glenn Dennis's story as dramatized by Unsolved Mysteries. In 1947, Glenn Dennis was 22 years old. And so let's um, let's go back to that. The initial claims of recovered alien bodies came from the second-hand accounts of Barney Barnett and Pappy Henderson after their deaths. On August 5, 1989, Stanton Friedman interviewed former mortician Glenn Dennis. Dennis provided, so that's quite interesting, he's a mortician. Dennis provided an account of extraterrestrial corpses endorsed by prominent Roswell ufologists Don Berliner, Stanton Friedman, Kevin Randall, and Don Schmidt. Dennis claimed to have received four or five calls from the airbase with questions about body preservation and inquiries about small or hermetically sealed caskets. Uh, he further claimed that a local nurse told him she had witnessed an alien autopsy. Glenn Dennis has been called the star witness of the Roswell incident. On September 20, 1989, an episode of Unsolved Mysteries included the second-hand stories of alien bodies captured by the army and transported to Texas. Now, are you guys starting to get a weird feeling like, whoa, so there were aliens. The episode was watched by 28 million people. In 1994, Dennis's account was portrayed by Unsolved Mysteries and dramatized in the made-for-TV movie Roswell. Dennis appeared in multiple books and documentaries. In September 1991, Dennis co-founded a UFO museum in Roswell, along with Max Littell and a former RAAF public affairs officer, Walter Hart. There it is. So do you think um, this guy made some money out of his story? He's got a museum and there's a research center and you obviously pay to go in. Dennis provided false names for the nurse who allegedly witnessed the autopsy. Um, that's that's kind of a bit strange. Uh, why would you do that? Pre presented with evidence that no such person exists, existed, Dennis admitted to lying about the name. Okay. Carl Flock observed that Dennis's story sounds like a B-grade thriller conceived by Oliver Stone. Scientific skeptic author Brian Dunning said that Dennis cannot be regarded as a reliable witness, considering that he had seemingly waited over 40 years before he started recounting a series of unconnected events. Yeah, so why would you wait 40 years to suddenly do your big reveal? Such events, Dunning argues, were then arbitrarily joined to form what has become the most popular narrative of the alleged alien crash. Prominent UFO researchers, including Flock and Kevin Randall, have become convinced that no bodies were recovered from the Roswell crash. And so, you know, um, it's not like all uh, ufologists are crackpots. Um, some are, how can I put it? Some are, have got, um, less than honest intentions and others are sincere, right? Some are sincere. Has anyone here seen the movie Contact? Anyone here seen the movie Contact? Well, this is the movie poster for Contact. I wonder if I can uh, do that. Can you guys see that? Now, 
I just want to address the the, the the deep psychology for why we we want to believe there's someone out there, right? And I think the movie Contact really resonates and touches on that psychology, which is that, and this is a bit of a spoiler, um, we want to know we're not alone, but but we we, we you know we we don't mean that in that we hope that they're locusts on Mars or that we hope that they are uh, cockroaches on um, Pluto. You know that's not the kind of not aloneness that we're thinking about. We're thinking about is there someone like us? Like is there an uncle or an aunt? You know, in the movie Battlestar Galactica, there's this idea that the races of man get spread across the, the galaxies, that kind of idea. Also in Star Wars, you know, there are um, human type um, beings all over the, the galaxy, right? And so it's that idea that there's a kind of fraternity out there that, that might be well-intentioned towards us and could help us. But also that there might be someone out there that um, that is looking over you, you know, and the movie Contact really touches on this idea that of, of life after death or life after Earth <clears throat> or, li or life beyond Earth. And, and the whole message of that of that film is really comforting. It's a comforting thought, but is it realistic? Uh, is it is it comfort is, is it realistic to think that there's some father figure out there or some cousin figure out there that you could uh, um, you know, have an encounter with that might give you a lightsaber or some kind of special device that's going to solve all your problems? Or is the reality that there's just miles and miles and miles of cold, uninhabitable space, right? Um, so the person that um, Jodie Foster encounters on this alien planet looks just like her father. It's not her father, but it looks like her father and, and he communicates to her in a very fatherly way, um, which in a way, as far as I'm concerned, is a bit of a mind fuckery because it plays into that whole psychology of, well, I lost my father. I really hope he's still out there. You go to an alien planet and guess what? There he is. And it's all very dreamy. It's a nice blue. The, the planet kind of looks like a blue beach. And um, and it's very very uh, sweet and, and a nice place, um, just extremely unrealistic, right? But it, it nevertheless is quite a good movie and worth thinking about. I will share my theory of, of aliens and the reality of that at the end of this. You know, let's get back to Roswell. Um, competing accounts and schism, a proliferation of competing Roswell accounts led to a schism among ufologists in the early 1990s. The two leading UFO societies disagreed on the scenarios presented by Randall Schmidt and Friedman Berliner. One issue was the location of Barnett's account. A 1992 UFO conference, so even they can't agree amongst themselves, um, conference attempted to achieve consensus among the various scenarios portrayed in Crash at Corona and UFO Crash at Roswell. However, the publication of the truth about the UFO Crash at Roswell resolved the Barnett problem by simply ignoring Barnett and citing a new location for the alien craft recovery, in, including a new group of archaeologists not connected to the Barnett story. Now, I don't really want to go into all of this. Uh, we're already almost at the two-hour mark. Um, this is all the sort of subtext to the Roswell incident, the mythology, essentially. Um, but you do have this book, The UFO Crash at Roswell. There's the um, there's one of the aliens found at Roswell. As you can see, it's a very clear image. You can very, very clearly see uh, what the alien looks like. Um, you know, it's um, a very clear color image, right? Um, I don't know if you... Picking up, I'm being a bit sarcastic. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to go into that. 
Um, there's another book that General Arthur Exon had been aware of, Debris and Bodies, but Exxon disputed his depiction. Glenn Dennis's claims of an alien autopsy in Grady Barnett's alien body accounts appeared in the book. However, the dates and locations were changed without explanation. Make of that what you will. So all of these are books that came out with uh, adding more um, background or adding more um, information to the Roswell incident. You can see this is a very long look. We're not even halfway through this this article. Um, then there's this book, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. Um, they claimed a cargo plane delivered alien bodies to Dwight Eisenhower. The book abandoned the Barnett Cross site. So every successive narrative is just basically imagining um, a different scenario. And so this is the Air Force's response. Under pressure from a New Mexico congressman and the General Accounting Office, the Air Force provided official responses to Roswell conspiracy theories during the mid-1990s. The initial 1994 USAF report admitted that the weather balloon explanation was a cover story, but for Project Mogul, a military surveillance program. So uh, kind of what's going on here <clears throat> is the military misled American citizens, then conditions changed in two ways. You had the conspiracy theories and the mythology, and all of it's unopposed. So the fact that nobody opposes it makes it seem like it's, it's real and credible. Um, but the other thing that changes is the Cold War ends. And, and so in 1994, the military say, okay, I think it's time that we deal with this. This is actually getting quite damaging. Um, and they basically say that that they did mislead the public and that it, what it was, it was a spy thing. And so they, they admit that they lied, which is, which is another way of saying telling the truth. Um, do these ufologists admit that they have lied? Um, published the following year, the Roswell Report, Fact versus Fiction in the New Mexico Desert, supported this with extensive documentation. Now, this is one would assume real military classified documents, not faked to look like real military documents, that narrowed the cause of the debris to a specific mogul balloon train launched on June 4, 1947. Now, you'd imagine if the army had lied about this, right? I'm talking about, yeah, if they had lied about it and it was never a weather balloon and there was never a balloon, then um, they wouldn't still be talking about a balloon um, 50 years later. And guess what they are? They are talking about it being a balloon, but they're saying it's not a weather balloon, right? And so we still left with the, the conundrum how can you have a weather balloon with a saucer? Is it a saucer or a balloon? Right? That was our original question. Within the UFO community, the reports were not accepted. The UFO researchers dismissed the reports as containing no information about MJ-12 or extraterrestrial corpses. So by this time the counter narrative has gotten so much traction that people are willing to just say, I, I just don't believe it. I, I, I simply don't believe it. Um, contemporary polls found the majority of Americans doubted the Air Force explanation. And I must say that reminds me a lot of the Madeleine McCann case where the police investigate the case the police aren't allowed to talk about the case because of Portuguese secrecy laws. And then by the time they are allowed to talk about it, the traction that all of the PR has gotten becomes the mainstream narrative. And so when the police then say, this is what we saw, this is what we found, a large fraction of people simply just don't believe it. Because when you repeat a story often enough, it becomes truth or certainly truth of a sort. 
And so are you one of them? Are you one of those people who, who just doesn't believe the American uh, Air Force explanation? Are you, are you one of those people? Thanks, Christine. Okay, so let's go on. News media and skeptical researchers embrace the findings. So that's quite interesting. The news, so let me ask you, are the news media um, more gullible than we are? Um, or are we... Um, Harder to fool than the news media. What, what did you say? I don't know why it's always so hard to do this. Diane says, I don't believe in UFOs, aliens, or flying saucers. Okay. But that, that's not the, the question. The question is, do you think that the news media um, have a are less gullible than we are, or do you think we are less gullible than the news media? Okay. Anyway, so in this case, the news media embrace. <clears throat> the report from the government so let me ask you do you agree with it with, with that assessment i just need to get some more water I'll, I'll leave you with that thought do you agree with the, the news media in accepting the army's explanation let's hear what you guys say let's do a poll how many of you agree that they were right to accept the, those findings Okay, well, I would say I agree with what the news media said there. Um, Project Mogul offered a cohesive explanation for the contemporary accounts of the debris, failing only to explain later conflicting additions. Carl Sagan and Phil Klaus noted the symbols from the 1947 debris <coughs> described by, let's put it up a bit bigger, described by Jesse Marcel as alien hieroglyphics, were easily explained as matching the symbols on the adhesive tape that Project Mogul sourced from a New York toy manufacturer. How's that? How's that for a conspiracy theory? Wow, we, we found alien hieroglyphics. No, 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 no. Those are um, symbols used on adhesive tape from a New York toy manufacturer. <laughs> Um, in 1997, the Air Force published a second report, the Roswell Report, case closed. It detailed how eyewitness accounts of military personnel loading aliens 
into body bags match the Air Force's procedures for retrieving parachute test dummies in insulation bags designed to shield temperature-sensitive equipment in the desert. So there's an alien autopsy taking place that's based on the 1995 film. There's another alien autopsy taking place. Um, the extremely influential program was satirized by the X-Files. So look at that word, pseudo-documentaries. In other words, documentaries that purport to be documentaries, documentaries that are actually um, more likely fiction than fact, have played a major role in shaping popular opinion of Roswell. Um, I can see from my I can see from my view and numbers that um, a substantial fraction of those watching don't want to hear really what this Wikipedia article is saying. Um, they want to hear um, the the shocking, scary alternative narrative, I guess. Um, alien autopsy centers around Santini's hoax footage. Okay, we're going to skip that. Over 20 million viewers watched the purported autopsy. Fox aired the program immediately before and implicitly connected to the fictional X-Files, which later parodied the film. Okay, let's... So, so all of this is... Um, all, of, all, of, all of these things are really... Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, books, documentaries, it's all media around just this idea of the Roswell incident, what really happened. Now let's look at uh, debunked or fringe theories. Roswell has remained the subject of divergent popular works, including those by ufologist Walter Bosley, paranormal author Nick Redfern, and American journalist Annie, Annie Jake Jacobson. In 2011, Jacobson's Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base, featured a claim that Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele was recruited by Soviet leader Joseph Stalin to produce grotesque child-sized aviators to cause hysteria. The book was criticized for extensive errors by scientists from the Federation of American Scientists. His historian Richard Rhodes, writing in the Washington Post, also criticized the book's sensationalistic reporting of old news and his error-ridden reporting. He wrote, all of her main sources claims appear in one or another of the various publicly available Roswell UFO Era 51 books and documents churned out by believers, charlatans, and scholars over the past 60 years. In attributing the story she reports to an unnamed engineer and Manhattan Project veteran, while seemingly failing to conduct even minimal research into the man's sources, Jacobson shows herself, at a minimum, extraordinarily gullible or journalistically incompetent. Now, um, the idea that the U.S. military wanted people to believe in UFOs, I think, is uh, natural, but I think it is um, mis it is um, incorrect. So, the, you know, the idea that the U.S. military are up to no good and they, they intentionally want people to believe in UFOs, um, the, the people who intentionally want you to believe in UFOs are the people who believe in UFOs. And um, we can see that there's a, a ready market, that there's a, a big appetite for that kind of belief. People want to believe something, well, just give them what they want. Just offer them evidence, but like manufacture the evidence and offer it as real evidence. Easy. In September 2017, UK newspaper The Guardian reported on co Kodachrome slides, which, had, which some had claimed showed a dead space alien. First presented at a bee witness event in Mexico, um, attended by 7,000 people, Days afterwards, it was revealed that the slides were, in fact, of a mummified Native American child discovered in 1896. So, um, to me, what the 
as someone who's involved in the true crime space, to me, what, what the whole UFO thing shows is the appetite for people to take advantage of other people, to, to lie, to manipulate, to try and take advantage of other people. Um, yes, something else. In February 2020, an Air Force historian revealed a recently declassified report of a circa 1951 incident in which two Roswell personnel donned poorly fitting radioactive suits with oxygen masks while retrieving a weather balloon after an atomic test. On one occasion, they encountered a lone woman in the desert who fainted when she saw them. One of the personnel suggests they could have appeared to someone unaccustomed to then modern gear to be alien. I must say that's the weakest story yet. And so now we get to, I guess, the official explanations, if you're interested. Secrecy around the initial incident was due to Cold War military programs rather than aliens. Contrary to evidence, UFO believers maintain that a spacecraft crashed near Roswell and Roswell remains synonymous with UFOs. B.D. Gildenberg has called the Roswell incident the world's most famous, most exhaustively investigated and most thoroughly debunked UFO claim. And I have to say, you know, how hard is it to just go and read up about Roswell? Like if you if you if you thought about it, if you are thinking about it, if you heard about it, how hard is it just to go and read up about it? And yeah, you have it, it is the most world famous. And I think when I read these words, I thought I must do a show on this because there's really is no mystery. It seems like there's a mystery. It seems like there's intrigue, but that's if you don't really focus on the actual narrative. If you kind of get sidetracked by all the stories that came out of it, then you're not going to know what happened. But if you go to the source material, literally the incident itself, forget about everything that was written 10, 20, 30 years later, then it's really not such a big mystery. And so when I saw that, you know, it's the most famous, but also the most debunked UFO claim. Why is it that people don't know that? There you have it. Okay, so let's continue. Accounts of alien recovery sites are contra contradictory and not present in any 1947 reports. Some accounts are likely distorted memories of recoveries of servicemen or parachute test dummies as suggested by the Air Force in their 1997 report. Carl Flock argues that proponents of the crashed saucer explanation tend to overlook contradictions and absurdities, compiling supporting elements without adequate scrutiny. And so this is what I've been saying. Um, Let's not pull any punches. The Roswell UFO myth has been very good business for UFO groups, right? You can make a lot of money selling this shit. It's been good for people writing books. It's been good for Hollywood. It's been good for the town of Roswell. It's been good for the media. Um, and it says here, the number of researchers who employ science and its disciplined mythology is appallingly small. And I, I would say I'm probably one of them. Um, I'm employing science here to say, okay, what evidence is there really of what happened here? And the reason besides that sentence that, that stood out to me, why I wanted to present this to you guys was really down to two things. Going to Roswell, you know, the fact that it's a place that really exists in America, and also one particular photo, that one particular photo just provides the answer in a second. I'm going to show that photo to you in a moment. Are we there yet? So yeah, we, yeah, we, now we are dealing at last with Project Mogul. What was Project Mogul? What did this craft look like in Project Mogul? And what is this? How do we resolve this problem of something that's a balloon or it's a flying saucer? 
how do we resolve that problem? Well, we're about to resolve it by finding out what the secret project was, as, as easy as that. A 1994 U.S. Air Force report identified the crash object from 1947 as a Project Mogul device. And we can go to Project Mogul. Uh, I'm not going to go there right now. Mogul, the classified portion of an unclassified New York University atmospheric research project, was a military surveillance program employing high-altitude balloons to monitor nuclear tests. Now, there's an image from Project Mogul. Now, if you ask me, none of that looks like a saucer, does it? But do you agree that a lot of these objects look um, like they may be using pieces of wood and, and, and possibly foil? Also, if you saw that in the air and you didn't know what it was, you might think um, maybe if you saw that today and you didn't know what it was and you saw it from a distance, you, you might say, well, that's not flying like an airplane. Um, what is that? Um, the project launched flight number four from Alamogordo Army Field. See, I'm getting better at saying that name. On June 4th, flight number four was drifting towards Corona within 17 miles of Brazil's ranch when its tracking equipment failed, right? And so what did we say from the beginning? That this was a crash, right? Something crashed. Why? Because something didn't work on the craft. The military charged with protecting the classified project claimed that the crash was of a weather balloon. Major Jesse Marcel publicly described the claims of a weather balloon as a cover story in 1978 and 1991. So th there's no denying that it was a cover story and that it makes sense that it was. In the US Air Force report, Robert Weaver states that the weather balloon story may have been intended to deflect interest from Mogul, or it may have been the perception of the weather officer because Mogul balloons were constructed from the same materials. So what they're saying is it could have been an innocent mistake as well, or a combination of deflecting information, giving a plausible explanation. That wouldn't raise question, questions. Sheridan W. Cavett, who accompanied Marcel to the debris field, provided a sworn witness, witness statement for the report. Let's see if we can see that. There it is. Uh, I do by I, I do hereby voluntarily and of my own free will make the following statement. I was a counterintelligence corps special agent for the U.S. Army Air Force. Um, Shortly after arriving at Roswell, at that time I had occasion to accompany one of my subordinates to a ranchland area outside of Roswell to help recover some material. I think that this request may have come directly from Major Marcel. I do not know who, have, who may have made the report to him. To the best of my knowledge, the three of us traveled to the aforementioned ranchland by ourselves. I believe we had a military jeep. When we got to this location, we subsequently located some debris, which appeared to me to resemble bamboo-type square sticks, one quarter to one half inch square. That's quite specific. Uh, they were very light, as well as a sort of metallic reflecting material that is also very light. I also vaguely recall some sort of black box, like a weather instrument. The area of this debris was very small, about 20 feet square, and the material was spread on the ground, but there was no gouge or crater or other obvious sign of impact. I remember recognizing this material This material as being consistent with a weather balloon. We gathered up some of this material which would easily fit into one vehicle. There certainly wasn't a lot of this material or enough to make up crates of it for multiple airplane flights. Uh, what Marcel did with this material at the time was unknown to me, although I know now from reading about this incident in numerous books that it was taken to eight Air Force headquarters 
in Fort Worth, where it was subsequently identified as a weather balloon, which I thought it was all along. I thought it was all along. I've reviewed the pictures in the 1991 book by Randall and Schmidt on the UFO crash at Roswell when Marcel and Remy are holding up this material, and it appears to be the same type of material that we picked up from the ranch land. I did not make a report of this incident to my headquarters since I felt that the recovery of a weather balloon was not a big deal that did not merit a written report. So, you know, his whole assessment is this isn't a big deal. In, in other words, in real time, on the ground, in reality, he finds this thing and he doesn't think it's a big deal. But the words and the missing links and the... Um, missing space for what this thing really is fires up everyone's imagination and now it becomes whatever you want it to be uh it goes on to say the book seems to imply this was in some sort of conspir conspiratorial tone however it is more likely i told him not to mention it to our headquarters because we had wasted our time recovering a balloon i only went to this area once and recovered debris once to the best of my knowledge, there were no other efforts to go back there. If there were, they did not involve me. There was no secret of effort or heightened security regarding this incident or any unusual expenditure of manpower at the base to deal with it. In fact, I do not recall the incident being mentioned again as being any big deal, and I never even thought about it again until well after I retired from the military when I began to be contacted by UFO researchers. Many of the things I've mentioned to these people have either been taken out of context, misrepresented, or just plain made up. I did know both Jesse Marcel and Bill Rickett very well. Both are now deceased. I considered them to be good men. However, both did tend to exaggerate things on occasion. With regards to claims that we tested this material by hitting it with sledgehammers without damaging it, I do not recall any of us doing so. I also did not test this material for, for radioactivity with a Geiger counter or anything else. If you guys want to read this on your own time, I'll put a link in chat. I wonder where Stephanie is. I haven't seen her in a while. Um, anyway, I do not recall attempting to burn any of this debris, but my wife tells me she recalled that Jesse Marcel, his wife and son, did have a small piece that they held over the fire when we had a cookout. In short, I did help recover some debris near Roswell, New Mexico in the summer of 1947. I thought at the time and think so now that this debris was from a crashed balloon. I'm not part of any conspiracy to withhold information from anyone, either the US government or the American public. I've, I've never been sworn to any form of secrecy by anyone concerning this matter, and I've received authorization from the Secretary of the Air Force to discuss with Colonel Weaver any information of a classified nature that I may have concerning it. There is no classified information that I'm withholding. I've never been threatened by the US government. My bottom line is that this whole incident was no big deal, and it certainly did not involve anything extraterrestrial. Well, there you have it in the last sentence. Anyway, that's his view. Um, UFOlogists had previously considered the possibility that the Roswell debris had come from a top secret balloon. Okay. When the civilians and personnel from Roswell stumbled upon the highly classified project and collected the debris, no one at Roswell had a need to know about information concerning Mogul. This fact, along with the initial misidentification um, and subsequent rumors that the capture of a flying disc occurred, ultimately left many people with unanswered questions that have endured to this day. So they are the anthropomorphic dummies. Those aren't aliens. Those are similar to mannequins. There's one in the desert. Um, the 1947 Roswell accounts did not mention alien bodies. We've, we've touched on that. So I want to um, reveal to you, so you've seen that picture. Uh, where is, 
what I'm looking for. Project Mogul. So um, yes, project. There's a picture from Project Mogul. I think I've got another one. I hope so. Um, so there's the relative height. They can you guys see that? There's the relative height of the Project Mogul um, balloon train. So so it's almost as high as half as high as the um, Eiffel Tower. And I guess it's about twice as high as the Statue of Liberty and almost as high as, almost of similar height as the Washington Monument. Uh, where is it? Well, I'm feeling a little bit embarrassed. I thought I had a, an image that I now don't seem to have. I thought it was here. Let's see if I can find <clears throat> find it. Okay, I found it. Begun in 1946, Project Mogul was a top secret attempt to acoustically detect suspected Soviet nuclear explosions and See any audio. launches. The project was accorded the highest priority because it addressed the most important post war national defense concern development of an early warning system to prevent a devastating surprise attack. Anyway, I'm not going to look at that now. I want to refer your attention to the Air Force News Special Report. You can see the, the Roswell Report case closed. And remember I said it all came down to a single image. Well, look at that. Can you guys see that picture? So there you have a balloon, and the balloon then connects to the saucer, and you can see that the saucer appears to be made out of a kind of tin foil. You can see it's kind of a flimsy saucer, right? And um, you, would would this fit into the trunk of a vehicle? Um, I don't think it would. Um, I'm not sure if this is too far in the foreground, but you can imagine similar sized uh, or similar shaped sources at the bottom of these balloons that are that have got a little bit of material inside of them. And so that is now what is seen as a UFO, right? So there you have it in one picture, the saucer, right? And the balloon that is that is keeping it aloft. Right, the you have it in one picture, and it, as I said, it comes from this report um, from the U.S. military. And here's another um, saucer. Just trying to see what this one is. Uh, I don't know whether that is a saucer with the um, balloon disconnected. But this is a, I guess, an American, another American product. Uh, following a supersonic test flight in 1972, a Viking space probe awaits recovery at White Sands Military Ranger. So um, my impression is that this is what the fuss has been all about. A, a thing that looks like a flying saucer, but is actually part of the apparatus of a weather balloon. And so... My interpretation, uh, I don't know why they don't just show the original and might be out there. Maybe I just haven't seen it. But it's basically 
a small saucer, smaller than that. That is that. So if it's not a question of is it a weather balloon or a flying or or a disc. It's both. It's not one or the other. It's both. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you guys? That um, what has been the source of all of this confusion is kind of saying, well, it's not a weather balloon, it's a flying saucer, right? And then the military is saying, well, it's not a flying saucer, it's a weather balloon. Well, ultimately, isn't it both? Isn't that where the uh, issues come into it? So what I'm trying to say is what you're seeing in this image, a smaller version of that flying saucer, and you can see the... The, the this material looks flimsy. It looks like it's almost like um, a tent-like material or a fabric, right? So something like that on a smaller scale under a balloon. And there you have it. So um, that is, as far as I'm concerned, the Roswell incident that it was a weather balloon. It was done because of secrecy uh, in terms of uh, spying on Russia. And, um, and then you had, because of, because of that secrecy, it spawned this huge industry where a lot of people made a lot of money and the, the government didn't respond to that or counter it for a long time, which allowed it to gain traction. So, so my assessment is basically, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, no UFOs or whatever you want to call it have ever been found on our planet. Um, and in terms of your reality and in terms of my reality, UFOs and aliens don't exist. You can talk about it, you can imagine it and so on. Um, and, and maybe you, a lot of your life is dedicated to that. Good for you. But the reality is, it's not really part of our reality. Do I believe in um, aliens or UFOs? I, I do think that there is life on on other planets. I think the size of the universe probably makes that a certainty. That, given you know um, the amount of of um, galaxies out there and star systems that are out there, it's more likely than not that there are other beings out there. So I do believe that aliens exist. I do believe that they would have craft of some sort, but I don't think that they have made it to Earth. And I think if they had made it to Earth, we wouldn't be here anymore. And, and that's the part that I think is a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of, uh, what's the word, naivete. Uh, if, if you've been hoping to have an encounter with an alien, um, uh, the reality would be the alien would very likely um, be hostile to us in the same way that once upon a time when a certain kind of human being traveled to other countries that, that didn't actually exist as other current countries, what did they do? So even though they were of the same species, even though we were of the same species, what did we do when we encountered other human beings in far-flung places? Well, we did a combination of things. We colonized them. We exterminated them. We um, took over um, or were taken over, right? And so if human beings can do that to other human beings, what do you think another species is going to do? A species that's got the power to get themselves from some fucking far away part of the universe to here. That means they've got incredible technology and incredible uh, resources at their disposal. What do you think they're going to want to do with Earth? Do you think they're going to want to keep people around as a sort of a zoo? No, uh, they would be interested in um, using the Earth for their own purposes, which would mean we'd all be expendable, right? So... You know, it's absolutely true what DMC says. Uh, you, you may be thinking in a sort of a dreamy way, oh, I wonder if the aliens are out there and you know, that looked like a alien spaceship. Um, if aliens, God forbid, do find this planet, 
well, we're not going to be here for very much longer. We will be wiped out. We will be wiped out. AM says, how late am I? You're pretty late to the game. they would annihilate us. So there's a very small chance that there's some alien out there that's that's um, like E.T. Um, that would um, be fascinated by our forests or something like that. But like I say, if they had the technology to get themselves here, um, they wouldn't mess around. They, they wouldn't mess around. They certainly wouldn't. Uh, retrieve a lost ET and not come back. Um, our planet is really a very uh, remarkable jewel of life. It's got so many resources, many that are still untapped. Um, and, um, you know, the idea that some other civilization would want our planet wholesale um, is, uh, is, is, is quite likely. And, they, they, and, and since we are the custodians, maybe that's the wrong word. We, we are the sort of loc the, the locusts of our time, the consumers consuming resources. They wouldn't want us to be part of that equation because they would want to consume the resources, right? Or perhaps to some extent be custodians of it. Who knows? Um, the Aristocat says, thank you, Nick. I grew up in Las Vegas and aliens were a cultural fact. Okay. Uh, Gimshi says, we are the aliens. We are literally star seed from eons removed. So another thing that um, I believe, and I, I read a book, if you guys are interested, it's called The Fifth Miracle. Uh, it is available on Amazon. Um, can you guys see that? Um says the search for the origin and meaning of life are we alone in the universe in this pro provocative and far-reaching book uh internationally acclaimed physicist and writer paul davies confronts one of science's great outstanding mysteries the origin of life this is not does life exist somewhere else but where does life come from um three and a half billion years ago mars resembled earth it was warm and wet and could have supported primitive organisms if life once existed on Mars, might it have originated there and traveled to Earth inside meteorites blasted into space by cosmic impacts? Davies builds on scientific discoveries and theories to address larger questions of existence. That might, might sound far-fetched. I found it a fascinating uh, read. Uh, the, the, this idea that life... Uh, primitive life, but life originated on Mars, and, and it took a really long time for life to sort of get going, you know, like algae and, and just very primitive life. And then that life, um, whether in the form of, um, what do they call them? It's not Furio, um, but it's, 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 it's kind of a, a bacteria that can survive very high temperatures and so essentially a bacteria uh, inside rock or um yeah may have transported to the earth and there's even some bacteria that can survive the vacuum of space and um and then life on earth basically got a didn't 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 arrive from zero it was actually had come from having evolved to some extent somewhere else under good conditions. And then the conditions when they were ripe on Earth uh, gave the, the, the life a, a, a start. It's certainly a very interesting theory and may explain why there's the superabundance of life on our planet and, and, and not elsewhere. Um, Of course, there are many other theories for where life came from. Um, Ivan says, life originates from outside the universe, not from within it. Okay.
Okay, well, let's um, do that. Uh, DMC says, the fact that humans traveled to the moon over 50 years ago and haven't gone any further puts things in perspective, really does. Unless I'm enjoying DMC's comments, there are a couple of um, other comments as well. Uh, English Bottle Cap says, I would like to think that if we could travel to other inhabited worlds, we would be able to coexist with other non-threatening life forms. Um, well, you know, one way to think about that is if we travel to other islands, you know, what have we done? And um, <clears throat> the fact is, the fact is on our planet, the only places that are, the only pristine wildernesses left on our planet are remote places that people don't really want. Otherwise, we would take them and and um, utilize them. And utilize them means you get rid of whatever is there. You, you, you um, uh, butcher the wildlife, you cut down the forests, you tar the roads, you uh, destroy the vegeta vegetation <clears throat> and plant crops and, and, and whatnot. So if you want an idea of how we would treat other planets, just look at how we treat our own planet. Of course, we do have a certain amount of uh, nature reserves on Earth, and there is a little bit of interest in preserving um, uh, our world, um, but there's far more interest in taking and um, uh, exploiting. There's far more interest in cutting down forests and uh, making money out of that than in planting forests. Uh, let's have a look at some of your comments. By the way, um, uh, is um, is uh, Jelsey in chat? I, 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 there you are. Jelsey, if you see comments like the one from Trent Stanley, please kick them off chat like immediately. We really don't need those sort of people on on here. Okay. Um, the reality with life is that that living organisms compete with one another for limited resources. So, in a way, it's not personal, um, and you know, when you in the deserts of Namibia and you see, we didn't see it this time, but I saw it previously, you see lions that hang out at the watering hole and they know that the antelope are going to come there to drink water, right? It's very cruel. I mean, imagine if, imagine if there was a serial killer that lived at your local supermarket and you had to get in your car and go to that supermarket every once in a while to stock up but you know there's a serial killer that literally lives in that supermarket he lives there because he knows that um that you're going to go there and so are a lot of other people and so but and you do have to go there because you know that's your supermarket that's the reality in places like namibia where these lions haunt these watering holes and the animals have to go there uh, if they don't go there, they're going to die of thirst. So they go to the watering hole, they take the risk, and some of them get caught by lions. And that's a horrible death. I mean, imagine being killed by being basically eaten alive or, or, or something like that. So, you know, nature is cruel. Um, but I, I don't know if there's a crueler species than, than our own. I don't know if there's, I don't know if we are the the kindest species that's ever existed. Um, so I do recommend the fifth miracle. Um, if you if you are interested in UFOs and you're in, interested in that narrative, you might want to look at um, beyond the light barrier. Um, I did mention that fairly early on. I'm just wondering what I did with that 
um, information is it let me just um, see where it is so uh, I think it's available on Amazon Prime beyond the light barrier you guys can check it out if you're interested um, it's about a woman who says that she actually had a child with an alien and you can decide for yourself whether you believe it uh, I certainly found it pretty compelling the detail that she went into she's also got this ring on her finger so you know um, if you think that it's possible or likely that aliens exist and 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 so on then this is one way to um, look at that through the story of a woman who said she had a relationship with an alien and you can decide for yourself how scientific you think it is um, has the world changed much since this book was published so this is beyond the light barrier um, it says here let's just read this quickly uh, her life in, on Meton is fascinatingly described. Akon brought Elizabeth back to Earth after the birth of their son and continued to visit her thereafter. So obviously an alien child was born on the other planet and she left him behind there. Otherwise, you'd be like, oh, well, yeah, here is an alien. Um, we can, we've got proof of it. Akon explained how spaceship's light propulsion technology operated and how it allowed him and his people to travel across vast interstellar distances. This technology is explained in, in detail in the book. <coughs> and so the question is, has Elon Musk read this book and is he using this fantastic technology? Elizabeth was given a standing ovation at the 11th International Congress of UFO Research Groups at Base Baden in 1975. And so the question is, okay, so what's happened since 1975? We've had the technology explained to us of how to travel um, at the speed of light. Have we used it? Uh, it's quite a well-reviewed book. I think it's got 4.4 out of 5. So um, there you have it. Did someone reference Neil deGrasse Tyson? Uh, DMC says, why does all the UFO stuff mostly emanate from the USA? Is it the great need to be famous that people have over there? Um, well, this particular book is actually from South Africa. So I don't think it's a USA only thing, although I do think Roswell has kind of got the monopoly on um, on like the likeliest, although I don't think it happened, but the likeliest unlikely story of uh, Close Encounters. Well, I can't believe that this ended up being almost a three hour live. Um, But there you have it. So anyway, I hope you guys found this interesting. Uh, do I have any more photos to share with you guys? I think there's another one that's quite funny. Um, this was... This, this, this is a photo of me in Roswell. Uh, I'm not sure why it looks so weird. It's not the one that I meant to take. Uh, so anyway, I'm not really going to show you that photo. It's just not. This is a photo that I took in Roswell. Um, as you can see, it's like got a spacey theme all over the place. Um, in a in a road across the road from sorry in a shop across the road from this spaceport. 
you literally heard like um, almost the sound of the wind or something, like a ghostly sort of sound. And then you're supposed to go in and and have some kind of alien encounter, I guess, in, inside this building. I found it kind of quite cheesy. Um, what else do I have? This was a house quite near Roswell. I must say the um, the sky above it made it quite look look quite special. I don't know. You could almost imagine a spaceship landing out of the sky. Um, th that's not far from Roswell. Uh, this is a selfie I took in Roswell. Um, this is obviously the, the sign. Look how the the clouds give it a quite a atmosphere. Um, I've got a couple of other images. I'm just not sure if I can show them to you. That's basically so it's got a little bit of a fairground attraction feel to it. Uh, it's kind of a almost like a theme park. Roswell and um, you know it's in some ways for me a little bit silly another four smile next to some of the stuff there's that alien sticking his head out. Must say the sky was pretty conducive to alien type photos. Anyway, um, I, I do hope some of you have learned something from this. Or are there, are there some of you feel like you've? Um, got a better grasp of what really happened at Roswell or do you feel like well this is interesting but I don't really agree with what you're saying um, my opinion is that aliens do exist but uh, they exist far away and they're not going to have an impact on uh, on our situation here on earth um, Maybe they, they will in the fullness of time, but we certainly need to hope that they don't because whoever reaches whomever first, if we reach them first, we'll probably wipe them out. Uh, if they reach us, they'll probably wipe us out. So that's probably what's going to... And that's, that's assuming we survive anyway. That, that's assuming we can get over um, nuclear annihilation and... Um, whatever we're doing to ourselves on this planet. And that's our worst enemies at this point is ourselves. So, yeah. Um, Mal says, is what you presented only served to confirm what I already thought. So, Mal, you didn't learn anything? Did you not learn? Because I, I do think that that picture of the balloon with a craft under it, I think that's quite an important picture to be shown. Earth says, you've opened my mind to Roswell. I think others' encounters are theirs and should not be judged too critically. Yeah, so certainly if you've had an encounter, um, is there anyone here that's had an encounter with aliens? Uh, I think um, Terry says, I'd love to. Um, Terry, I'd like to know from Terry what... Um, why the whole alien thing is interesting to you. It, it seemed to be quite personal to you. 
Um, Jelsey said, I think that she's had some other experience. Now, the reason why I think Roswell is quite important is if Roswell is the source of all the mythology and Roswell is a hoax or it's something that's been taken out of context, what does that tell us about all those other things? Now, Terry is saying we should go and look at these other hotspots. Um, I've tried to make the case that I don't think we need to or we should because Roswell as is the most debunked UFO conspiracy. So so why 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 waste our time with other things? That's how I see it. Yeah, I'm also a Trekkie. I've definitely watched Star Trek quite a bit. Um, uh, Spock was awesome, wasn't he? Um, Chelsea says, I tried writing it here. It's too long, so I messaged you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Yvonne. That's good to hear. Thanks, Rookie. Appreciate it. Uh, Valerie says, please go over the Air Force videos. Um, I remember, um, I think I was in South Korea, and they saw something, and I remember seeing some other video where you saw a light moving and then it changed direction. And obviously you're thinking it's impossible that a craft could do that. But um, I think you've, you've got to constantly ask yourself, what is more likely? Human beings, mischievous human beings deceiving one another or that aliens exist? Which one's more likely? Same question with Roswell. What's more likely that something was something really plausible and ordinary, a, a, a kind of balloon with a thing under it, or that um, a, a, and that people lie to one another or that aliens exist? And how does the human mind work? Well, we're interested in the more exciting possibility. When it comes to true crime, we're always interested in the more exciting possibility. The more sick, shocking um, possibility, the better. We're more interested in that. We're not interested in the sort of drudgery, uh, commonplace thing. We, we want to believe that things are more shocking and exciting than they really are. Uh, and, and I think it, it, it's the dark, in the same way that we want the dark side to be darker than it really is, that, that's an expression of our, um, in terms of our own lives, we, we prefer to think of our lives in, through sort of fairy tale tropes, and that's not true either. And you've just had the same thing with the um, Kate Middleton, you kind of had this idea of everyone was getting caught up in the royals again and everyone was getting caught up in the um, the fairy tale of the royal family. And every single time that fairy tale gets kind of um, invalidated. I mean, Princess Diana showed what a nightmare it was and seems to be every subsequent person has said what a nightmare it was, but we keep wanting to believe it's a fairy tale. Now that Kate Middleton doesn't seem to be having such a good time, everyone is shocked. So, you know, the, the UFOs and fairy tales and thinking that crimes are worse than they are shows to me um, how easily we are taken off the track of reality, that reality is just too much for us. We would rather have a reality that is embellished. And that is how we are manipulated. We are manipulated by people that give us the reality that we want to hear, you know, the reality that is um, more interesting than what reality really is. I actually find reality incredibly interesting because of so few people who really want to see it for what it is. I'm not saying reality is easy. I'm just saying people seem to think reality is not very interesting. But I find... Um, the fairy tales and all that stuff really, really boring. Um, 
there's nothing that's more boring or a waste of time than embellished reality that turns out not to be true after all. There's nothing that is more a waste of your attention other than if you're watching something for fiction's sake and you want to be entertained. But if the whole idea is to edify yourself and educate yourself um, only to be constantly running away from reality, well, that, that's... that's um, it's it's a way to make you an ineffective person, right? This is how I see it. I don't know. Um, AM says, I really wish I'd found this live stream much earlier. Well, the live stream was put up, I think, a day ago. So it was floating around there for a while. Okay. Uh, we're at three hours. I'm going to go through the last couple of comments. I hope you guys are enjoying this new microphone that I bought. Um, I hope you guys are finding the audio has improved. I um, hope so. Has it? <laughs> um, okay, last couple of comments. Yeah, I must say um, it really is humbling um how little we really know about so many things it really is humbling um when i was in namibia um, there are also circles in the namib desert and people still to this day don't know why they're there some people think it's sort of the ancient foundations of huts but they really don't know for sure what they mean That's that's true. Reality is here and now, but um, how many of us are, are, are in the real objective reality? Um, fairly recently, I saw something where it very quickly crossed my mind that this is out of my field of experience and this is a real candidate for a UFO. And I think I told you about it. I was walking my dog. It was, um, I, th I think the sun had just gone down, but it was late afternoon, early evening. And um, I was on a field and um, I saw these lights in the sky. And uh, although there was a little bit of cloud, um, I could clearly see these lights in the sky. And I first thought, you know, is, is that a, it kind of looked like a train, it looked like a train that was moving in the sky. And then I thought, could it be like the, the windows of a airplane, but then you didn't see any flashing lights of the wings or you didn't see any wings or anything like that. And you certainly didn't hear the plane. And I mean, I got quite a good look at it, but I, I certainly couldn't, I couldn't explain it. And so I was like, wow, what was it? Did I just see an alien craft? And that's exactly how it goes. I can't explain what it is. So is it a UFO? And I think I mentioned it to my subscribers that day. And they said, that sounds like Starlink. They showed me a photo and I said, that is exactly what I saw. And, and so that was the explanation. AM, uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for that. Um, okay, we don't use our brains to its full capacity. Uh, Francis Brooks says, in America, it became cultural to believe in fairy tales. Valerie says, what if reality is not what we are experiencing? Yeah. Silent Murmur says, says, there's nothing more amazing to me than the reality of electromagnetic space and Earth phenomena. Um, Jane Hammond says, check out the Betty and Barney Hill story. See what you think. Um, Marin says audio has improved. That's good to hear. Uh, my, my dog is 
in the next room, so you're not going to hear him snoring. Uh, that's good, good to hear. Um, I also once, don't laugh, I once went horseback riding, but it was meant to be at midnight. And and um, so we about a dozen people riding these horses and um, a meteor literally crackled over my left shoulder. So we were we were in the last five or ten minutes of this ride and a meteor uh, kind of crackled over my left shoulder. And when I looked at it, you could see it kind of breaking into pieces. Um, and, and, and then you heard like a, like a crackle. And um, I couldn't believe it. Like um, I've seen the odd um, meteor, right? But I've never heard one. And so um, I was like, did I really just experience that? And so I asked the people that were next to me, did you guys see them? They said, yes. And so um, that was really incredible. Um, but of course, not, I, I never for a moment thought that that was an alien spaceship. And that's something that's happening all the time, or, you know, some, some space debris, rocks and whatnot are, are flaring across our atmosphere. Some of it hits the earth. Some of it vaporizes in the air, right? Uh, Jalsi says, I was interested from being hit by lightning. So scary. That does sound pretty scary. Uh, when I was in Namibia, I really got a very clear view of the Milky Way. You know, you, you, you don't have any light pollution, so you, you literally have this incredible um, exposure to the stars, and you realize uh, what you're missing in a way, you know, not being in that environment. And obviously, the ancients, as someone mentioned here, uh, every day, every night, they're looking up at the stars and they're trying to make sense. Try to make sense of it. And if you think about it, you know, um, think about a time before computers, before television, before movies, before radio, before worldwide narratives. Right? Um, imagine you wake up and and you happen to be born in Africa or or born, let's say. Um, whatever, 500 years earlier or a thousand years earlier, but for whatever reason, you wake up and you kind of surrounded by kind of mud huts and that's your life. And every night when the sun goes down and the, the darkness descends, you, you see light, right? What I mean is in the sun, uh, sorry, in the day, you've got the sun hovering in the blue sky when that goes down, instead of it just being dark, which is almost what you'd expect, it's almost like, okay, you know, like in a, the ceiling of a room, you turn the light on and then there's light. Well, when you turn the light off, you don't expect it to be light. You expect it to be dark. And so surely that must manifest in the kind of thinking where you say, well, when the sun goes down, why, do, why are lights coming out in the sky? What's that all about? It's a little bit like, Pandora, the forest, but but up in the sky. And I mean, you really appreciate just how many lights there are when you see the Milky Way glowing the way it does over a desert, you know, when there's like literally no pollution, no smoke in the sky, no um, light pollution. You realize just how bright the heavens are. What on earth are you going to make of them? You know, you don't know that they're planets. You don't know that they are... Um, uh, stars or whatever they are. And so in your primitive mind, what are you going to think that they are? What are you going to say that those things are? Um, you, and then they also move. Some of, You might notice some stars come up before the others and, and uh, become kind of familiar to you. And so they become, in a way, familiar in a symbolic way that this star is a god or a um, harbinger of this or that. But it's certainly, if you think about it, it's 
quite strange that when the sun goes down, it's not just a blank sky. There is there are the stars. And maybe there is somewhere there is some galaxy out there where you're so far out that when the sun goes down, there's nothing else to see. Maybe just like three stars. Who knows? But it certainly would be tempting to think that there must be a lot going on out there when there are literally billions of stars um, right above you, you know. Okay, um, I think that's it from me. I'm not going to talk too much more. Um, Terry says, I thoroughly enjoyed the northern lights when I lived in Alaska. I saw a little bit of, wasn't northern lights, but it was an effect from the northern lights when I was in Boise. It certainly was a bit of illumination in the sky. I um, certainly would like to see those. Um, a Jesus says, your images of Namibia sure seem alien. Well, the well, witch here, which lives about a thousand years, is definitely a, a curious thing. I'm, I must say plants, just, just the idea of something that puts its um, tissues into the soil and creates all of these structures. If you think about a plant, how, how different a plant is to us. Of course, our skin can change color in the same way that leaves can change color. Uh, Christine Webb, there may be more than one dimension. True. Deb Deborah says, I've always watched the sky. No one at all says they were no less primitive than we. Okay. Okay, guys, uh, thanks a lot for being here. I hope you've enjoyed this hopefully scientific investigation into the whole matter. We, we, we did keep it very um, kind of narrow in terms of basically what the Wikipedia um, narrative said. So it was, it was quite a simplistic way of looking at it. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessary to go into any more detail than that, but who knows. Um, I will still be doing the Hannah Gutierrez Reed um, verdict and also what immediately preceded that. Uh, I do think it's important that we just close that case by, by dealing with it. Unfortunately, the guy that I went with to Namibia with, um, we kind of had to, um, uh, what's the word, coordinate our schedule. So although it would have suited me to have, just finished the trial um, I just didn't quite have enough time to do that also I actually thought the Karen Reed case was going to start um, on the 13th and then I think while I was away they postponed it but anyway it is what it is uh, thanks so much I appreciate it thanks Chelsea uh, thanks Chelsea and Terry for being here uh, Earth says goodbye all. See you all next time. Thanks, guys, for being here. Also appreciate all the super chats. Uh, thanks a lot for your interest and commentary. I will um, see the Team Peachtree folk uh, tomorrow for the next episode of Van Gogh Letters, so don't miss that. If you've never watched one, stick around for a couple of minutes and see if it's your cup of tea. Okay, and with that, take care, enjoy the rest of your Saturday, and I'll see you guys next time. Ciao.